Hi, my name is Mary Dorshank, and welcome to today's webinar. I am uh, the director of the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable, and today we are hosting a webinar on using EHRs to impact change beyond the pop-up reminder. Um, I'd really like to thank you all for joining. We've had a lot of interest in this topic, and we really appreciate the wonderful turnout that we've had today. Um, so the purpose of today's webinar is to introduce all of you to a new resource we've produced, the eClinical Works Best Practices Workflow and Guide to Support Colorectal Cancer Screening. And on today's webinar, we'll review lessons learned in developing this, this tool, introduce you to key elements and recommendations, and hear from an FQHC about what it was like to implement some of this, um, some of this guidance in actual practice. Um, as will come of no surprise to all of you on the phone, request for assistance with EHRs is an issue we hear about almost constantly. And the NCCRT first began looking into these issues starting with the 2013 report we released jointly with the National Association of Community Health Centers that looked at how well EHRs were being used to support colorectal cancer screenings in the community health center setting. Our work on this topic advanced further with a September 2015 meeting uh, focused on how to improve EHRs to support colorectal cancer screening. And as we learned about the complexity and confusion around EHR use in greater depth, all signs pointed to the need for some practical tools that could provide guidance on model workflows and structured fields to support screening. So this guide was developed in concert with the National Association of Community Health Centers, the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors, the American Cancer Society, the Health Center Network of New York, and their member health centers. And we are really grateful for the time and resources they dedicated to this project, as well as to the CDC, which provided funding to support the work. We selected eClinical Works because it's one of the most commonly used EHR systems by community health centers. And our intent, if this is successful, is to try and develop similar guides for other EHR systems as we move forward. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. As was mentioned in the promotional materials, this is not an introductory webinar. While all are welcome to attend, this webinar is best suited for those who actively work with EHR systems. Um, also, please be aware that we are recording today's webinar. The replay and speaker slides will be shared with all of you within just a few days. Please feel free to share with any colleagues who are not able to join today. Um, also, because of the large number of participants, all participant lines are muted on today's webinar. You know, having said that, we still want to make sure that you get what you need out of this webinar, so we encourage you to ask questions by submitting them through the chat function of the webinar. We'll have um, time for questions after the presentations, and we'll answer as many as we can, and we will also be emailing around any responses to questions we don't have time to get to, and you can always follow up with any of us by email. Finally, we are always trying to improve our webinar, so we are asking for your help in evaluating this webinar, and you'll be receiving an email with a survey link. Uh, so please help us out by providing feedback, and uh, um, please know that we take your advice very seriously. Uh, so with that, we have uh, three great presenters uh, joining us today to share what they've learned in developing this guide. Uh, first, we have Sandy Corfascia, who's Executive Director with the Health Center Network of New York. Uh, Michelle Tropper, former Roundtable Steering Committee member, who is the uh, Clinical Quality Improvement Co Coordinator, also with the Health Center Network of New York. And finally, Dr. Uh, Carla Henke, who's the Chief Medical Officer of um, Community of Hope. So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to Sandy Carfaccia, who will give us an overview of some of our learnings from the project. Sandy? Thanks, Mary, <laughs> and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you know, myself and certainly the representatives here today with me, um, are, we're really pleased to have this opportunity to uh, provide an overview of this resource and then uh, certainly discuss particular elements in detail with you. I'm going to start with a brief summary of what's gone into and come out of this effort, and then Michelle Tropper and, and Dr. Henke will um, uh, take you through some of the, the details of the contents of the guide. So HCMNY, as we're casually known, is a network whose primary purpose is to provide support and guidance to member health centers as they work to improve their health info management systems, both technical and process oriented. So when we were approached by the National Association of Community Health Centers and American Cancer Society about the possibility of creating an EHR-specific guide, uh, it made perfect 
sense for us. All of the member health centers that we work with use the eClinical Works EHR system, uh, and therefore it is our product of focus that supports all of our clinical quality improvement work. And colorectal cancer screening has long been one of the priorities um, that our members have identified for us to focus on, and there is so much work to be done to encompass all of the necessary aspects. The, uh, the primary critical inputs for the development of the guide were really threefold. So there's staff expertise. The network staff have expertise in both the eClinical Works product, uh, the, the data structure uh, beneath that, and also um, within the, the healthcare sector and the clinician experience also from the EHR product and the workflow process and experience side. So we work closely with 20 health centers on a regular basis, and we enlisted four of those centers to dedicate additional time and attention uh, specifically to this effort. And uh, Dr. Henke, uh, who's here with us today, was one of those key participants. And finally, there's data. Um, HCNY has access to EHR data virtually every field across 17 community health centers and more than 200,000 patients. And not surprisingly, the data doesn't always support the workflow that the clinician leaders believe is being adhered to within their centers. And the data is also incredibly powerful in um, displaying the challenges, really quantifying some of the challenges that we all face given uh, the flexibility that's inherent in the EHR system. So we worked through the various aspects of colorectal cancer prevention and identification for about six months, um, you know, resulting in the guide that's available today. You all know that there's many ways to accomplish tasks within the EHR, NACW in particular, and rarely does one workflow suit everyone's needs. So the steps within the guide were developed with efficiency, effectiveness, and required reporting abilities in mind, and clearly improved prevention for patients. But sadly, until we're able to control EHRs mentally, like scientists have demonstrated with drone flight, there's still a lot of clicks involved, and there's no avoiding that. Um, Michelle's going to highlight for you within the presentation today some vendor enhancements that we're seeking to try and help address some of that, um, and she'll certainly talk about the challenges that prompted those enhancements. You know, in summary, there's something within the guide for everyone, whether it's the workflow charts, the discussion of billing guidelines, ICD coding for various circumstances surrounding colorectal cancer screening and follow-up, family history data capture. Um, it runs the gamut, and we've learned that ECW users and non-ECW users alike have found a lot of value in the resource. And, you know, for that, we're, we're certainly grateful since we did put a lot of work into this. Um, as I said, colorectal cancer screening has long been a focus within the network, and so we have measured uh, CRC screening rates from the EHR data uh, for many years. And so we recently went back to look at any impact that Perhaps we could draw a line um, and say, since the production of the guide, we've seen X amount of improvement. And while it's you know, really difficult to say what components or what pieces people may have put in play that helped to achieve improved outcomes, I'm really happy to tell you that in August of 2015, which was about the time we are in the you know, final throes of the guide development and all of the discussion and investigation um, are across the group of health centers that I discussed, the CRC rate was 28.05%. I know that probably sounds dismal to many of you. Um, it is data-driven only, no, no chart reviews involved, that's what the data showed. And, um, and actually, that's better than when we started in 2013. Um, in March of 2016, uh, not so long ago, that rate across that same group of health centers was 33.74%. And so that marks a 20% increase in that time frame from August to March in colorectal cancer screening 
outcomes. And, uh, you know, that's by far the largest jump in outcomes that we've ever seen uh, in, that, in a time frame like that since our tracking began in 2013. So I think we can draw a line, though, you know, we couldn't ever prove it with data, that clearly um, the guide has been really helpful in impacting that outcome. So finally, before I turn it over, I'd like to um, put a call to action for some of you, for the eClinical Works users that are with us here today. We would love to hear from you. If you are able to get into the guide, compare it to your workflows, um, attempt to implement some of what we suggested, or if you're um, sure that you have a, a better solution, um, we'd love to hear what do you do differently and why, um, because clearly there, there is more than one way. And um, so we've picked a good way, there may be better things out there um, that we can encompass. So we are all ears. Uh, for anybody that wants to help contribute. We plan to continue enhancing the guide in the future, so your feedback um, will be really valuable uh, alongside our deeper delving and our continued work with the vendor um, as we start to see some of our requested enhancements. So with that, I thank you for being here with us today, and now I'm going to give it over to Michelle Topper and Dr. Carla Henke. Okay. Thanks, Sandy. Um, on your screen, uh, there's um, a quote, and um, Sandy alluded to this in describing our project. Um, this is a quote from one of our, um, one of our uh, medical directors who worked with us on this project, and uh, it just uh, summarizes very nicely all the different competing priorities and um, you know, also the need to document, and certainly um, this project is all about uh, documentation and um, doing that in a standardized way in order to be able to um, report on performance and use that for improvement. So the um, process that we went through in putting together uh, the EHR Best Practice Workflow and Documentation Guide was to first interview uh, several of our uh, health centers who participated in the project to understand what their current workflows were in uh, documenting and ordering colon cancer screening, whether it be for FITFOBT or colonoscopy screening and the follow-up process, uh, documenting the follow-up outreach for incomplete tests, notifying patients of the test results, and then documenting family history. And um, what resulted is our guide, and you're going to see um, different components of that uh, throughout this presentation. And both um, Dr. Henke and I um, will discuss with you, you know, what we uncovered looking at the um, workflow and then the recommendations that we made for uh, documentation and how that's working. So we started out looking at FIT, FOBT workflow. And we wanted to both um, track and measure the distribution of the cards and uh, their return, uh, the tests that to ensure that the tests are being done for average risk colorectal cancer screening, and also look at uh, follow up and communication with patients to return the cards and uh, follow up on the test results. One of the um, recommendations uh, that we made was to associate the layup order with the ICG-10 code and to ensure appropriate billing for the test if you're billing for it. Uh, documentation of the test results and um, doing that in a consistent manner and uh, standard manner. And then generating a follow-up um, for a referral uh, for a colonoscopy if the FIT test result is positive. And some of the challenges were that uh, billing in ECW, and this is billing in ECW may be different if you use a different electronic medical record, but the um, procedure codes can be tied to the orders, and the users are prompted upon order to include the CPT, but that prompt um, does not exist when you're entering results or indicating receipt of samples, which are necessary for FOBT, FIT, and some centers are accidentally billing upon order due to the CPT linkage, and others are not billing at all due to complexity. 
Um, so we have recommended uh, workflow options for current and future orders that address this issue. But this is really one of those areas where we could really um, benefit from feedback and hearing about how people are addressing this. Um, as you know, uh, the billing should only take place once you um, have a sample or um, the test is completed. Um, so when you're generating a kit to um, give to a patient, if they're going to mail that kit into a lab, it's not coming directly back um, to the health center, uh, you would need to um, have a, another way of um, doing the billing than doing it at, right at that moment. And <clears throat> you could see here the um, workflow uh, for um, the billing options. And uh, we've identified um, whether the patient is mailing directly, um, where you would create um, an order and associate that order with a diagnosis code. And then you transmit that to a lab. Um, when you receive the results, then you would put in an appointment on your resource schedule or created a, create a telephone encounter um, in order to be able to um, bill for um, the FIT. And if um, the test is being brought into the office, you could create a future order upon the kit distribution, and then um, you could transfer that to a current order once the sample or the result is received. Um, so that's, this is what we identified in the workflow. And um, you know, I'll turn it over to Carla to make some comments on this, um, because this was definitely one of the um, workflow issues we identified um, when interviewing a community of hope. Sure. So we um, had initially offered to patients both options of bringing the test back to the office or mailing it in directly. And um, just a few glitches that we came across in that would, when the patients were mailing it directly, they were sometimes um, not, if, if we would have to transmit our order and make sure the order was in the envelope with the test uh, or with the sample itself. And so one um, glitch there is that if the sample is going to the lab without the order, then we never would get the result back. And then um, it was easy if we put a future order in for the patients who are going to bring it back into the office, but if they had the entire kit with them um, and then just read that, oh, I can just drop this in the mail, again, it wouldn't have the order attached. So um, we've now gone to making sure we staple our, we, we go ahead and put the order in and it gets transmitted in ECW to LabCorp. Um, our lab facility, and automatically um, at the time of giving the patient the kit to take home. And where we're now looking towards is um, what do we do in terms of we've already transmitted, we don't have that future order, um, who logistically in the office is best to create that encounter for the billing purpose once uh, we get the result back. So it's not once the patient brings the sample in, we're looking to do it when we have the test resulted. And that is something logistically in your own clinics that would be um, preferable to figure out ahead of time. So who on your staff will be doing that? Is it a medical assistant? Is it nursing staff? Um, is it provider staff? And we, we haven't quite figured that out, um, but I think um, you know compiling a list of all of those outstanding FIT or FOBT tests um, so that you can create that order so you can do the billing. And that, I think, has been the missing piece for us in this workflow, which is otherwise um, a, a great workflow for us and has been very instrumental in increasing our colorectal cancer screening rates. Thanks, Carla. So moving on to colonoscopy workflow, um, we wanted to um, still uh, ensure that the tests were being done for average risk colorectal cancer screening, that they're being done as follow-up to positive FIT or FOBT, uh, that there are tests that are done for high-risk patients that could be identified as such. And then <clears throat> we also look to address the follow-up communication with the patients to make the appointment with the specialist and follow-up communication with the patients on test results. Um, again, with 
colonoscopy. There was also documentation of test results that we looked at and documentation of follow-up. So some of the challenges, <clears throat> and these could be grouped into um, three areas. So the first is the reason for colonoscopy referrals. Um, we found that in many places um, the reason is um, not being um, entered as the reason for the colonoscopy um, because um, <laughs> they were um, leaving that to the um, specialist discretion. Um, and what we wanted to do is educate that the defender's purpose, the ICG-10 code is a reason code, not a billing diagnosis code. And we have the recommendations for associating the referrals with the ICD code. Um, this is one of the best ways um, if we could um, get folks to use this uh, when creating the referrals, um, this would be a really great way for us to then be able to capture um, the colonoscopies that were done for average risk screening or that were done as a follow-up to a positive uh, FIT or FOBT test because there are ICD-10 codes for each of those. Um, there's also ICD-10 codes for um, indicating the individual um, risk, and we'll get into some of that uh, a little bit later. The date the test was performed, this is a really key feature um, that we are encouraging people to use. The order date is commonly used as the date that the test was performed, and that's often the date that the patient was referred. Um, these are not the same, and as you may realize, it could sometimes take six months between when an individual is referred for a colonoscopy and when they actually have the test performed. And we are not going to be able to look at that timing um, as a performance measure. And if we want to know what the time is between when an individual receives a referral for a colonoscopy and when they actually have the colonoscopy done, uh, we don't have a really good way of measuring that accurately right now when um, the order date is being used as um, the same date as the test was performed, and we know that that is not what's happening. So we recommend including the actual date the test was performed um, in the DI order. And then there's also inconsistent capture in terms of the colonoscopy results. So the patient usually gets results from the specialist after colonoscopy, and there's a need to determine the lines of responsibility for patients that are co-managed by a specialist. Um, so this is one of the challenges um, in primary care in terms of um, the colonoscopy um, results and capturing those in the EHR. Um, here's the colonoscopy workflow on the DI order and uh, the colonoscopy referral. And um, you can see here where we have the um, association with the ICD-10 code recommended. That's right here in the process flow um, in the documentation guide. Uh, the recommendation to record the date the test was performed and documenting follow-up attempts with structured data. And I'm going to show the next part of the workflow as well and um, invite Carla to um, comment on this as well. So I, I would just like to reiterate the point of um, the changing the date for the date the test is performed and that um, the date that the results were received is really important as you're looking back historically for when a patient may need to be referred again. And of course, it's going to be in the results section and based on findings, but um, just for your own um, data personnel or whoever is helping manage the data, that's a good starting point. And then um, also for all ECWs out, users out there, making sure once you do have that report and it is attached to the order that um, the results received box is checked. That is really important depending on what you're using for your data pulls um, to actually have it captured as, as done, um, even if you have the report uploaded. So um, that would be um, a recommendation. And then um, down here, it's, you know, adding diagnosis to the problem list is 
I think um, a, a big point to stress for providers who are on the line that um, that's really helpful and um, we'll get into that a little bit more in terms of family history as well. And the, the last piece, and I, there will be some screenshots coming in up and we can review um, the importance of the structured data piece for, for following up on the colonoscopy because I think as many of you know, it's not the referring the patient to the gastroenterologist to have the test done, but it's more the getting the report back once the test has been completed or following up with the patient to ensure that they've gone to um, their colonoscopy appointment. Yeah. And then in terms of reporting purposes and being able to collect measurements um, from the EHR, it's very helpful if um, you know, people could um, move towards a consistent uh, documentation process for the results. And you'll see um, in a little bit, I'm going to show you um, what the variation is in types of results that um, we get when we go back and we pull this information um, from the records in order to uh, try to produce a measure. Um, if we want to know, you know, how many of the um, colonoscopies were um, positive um, or abnormal or positive for polyps, um, these are not being captured in a um, consistent way or even positive um, for cancer. So we made some recommendations about how to document, um, you know, within ECW uh, that would pull more consistent results uh, for measurement purposes. So in terms of uh, tracking follow-up and closing the loop, some of the challenges um, that we identified were in automated messaging. Uh, there are task lists that can be um, created for referrals and orders. Um, letters and automated messages can also be used, but there's no clear best practice and it's often challenging to design efficient workflow utilizing the right fields to support the automated messaging. And um, that's, <clears throat> that's because of some of the um, inconsistent or high variation in how, um, how these fields are documented within the electronic health record. So we recommend using structured data in the referral to document follow-up, and the next slide shows you an example of <clears throat> the um, structured data and how that's done. And uh, Carla, um, do you want to comment on this one as well? This sure. One so, <laughs> yeah, so what we've implemented since uh, participating in the workflow guide process is we have a referral coordinator who works, um, we have three locations and we have one referral coordinator per location. And so on a, a rolling basis every month, the the referral coordinator is given a list of all, um, all colonoscopies that have been ordered, so all patients who've had a colonoscopy DI um, generated. And they'll, they go, this is the 90 days out, so we're giving the patient and the specialist 90 days to get us the report back. And um, the, the referral coordinator then reaches out to the patient first to see have they scheduled the appointment. And this is in, we've created this in the structured data field uh, within the referral. And so it can then add the date to that. And if the patient says they did go get the appointment date, and if we still have not received the report, then our referral coordinator is reaching out to the specialist to get the report. And then there's, you know, we have our own internal workflows from there. If the patient says they didn't go, we, you know, we either update the referral or help arrange transportation or, um, the referral coordinator will pass it on to the appropriate, some another appropriate staff um, to do this. But we found that this tracking holds us accountable and then just um, helps us follow up with the patients a little bit better who may not have come back into the office since the time of the referral generation. And um, within the workflow, um, you know, these are uh, Here's an example from within the workflow, you know, whether the appointment was made or not um, in terms of documenting the follow-up attempts from the pending file and structured data, um, attempting to contact the patient 
and you know this is another way that um, the structured data can be used um, regarding follow-up calls. So uh, three follow-up calls, and then uh, additional notes can be added um, within the record uh, in the notes field. So we, um, we're going to turn now to talk a little bit about family history and documenting family history in the electronic health record. This was one of the major goals that we had um, from the um, roundtable and um, the American Cancer Society, very interested in being able to um, identify individuals at high risk of colon cancer uh, for earlier screening and, you know, how can we utilize um, the electronic health record to help do that. Um, and I'm going to share a few different quotes with you now from some of our um, providers. So first, um, you know, they're still working on the basic habit of colorectal cancer screening, and they haven't been able to look separately at risk factors. So while family history would be the natural next step, um, and uh, history of familial polyposis would further increase the risk of importance of screening, it's generally not known within families. Um, so, you know, that makes it more challenging to be able to collect that information, and there's still the challenges of just basic uh, risk for colorectal cancer screening. Um, another provider, I don't think we can impose on clinicians or staff to get more detailed or comprehensive in the history taking and documentation. It's a setup for liability issues, too time consuming and difficult to document, and then flag as an alert in the current EMR. I believe the best hope is in universal screening tests made inexpensive. Our patients, for example, often do not have a good picture of two parents and their genetic history. Um, so, you know, getting um, more into some of those challenges with individuals' knowledge about their own risk um, and, you know, what they what they know or don't know um, about their family history. And then uh, the newer the provider, the more open they are to suggestions, and people like to have options for documenting in the EHR. So um, keeping all this um, in mind as a backdrop, I'm going to uh, share with you some of um, uh, some other data capture challenges. And, you know, here is um, what we found uh, with some of the documentation uh, of uh, results um, in the EHR, so uh, there you can see here, patient did not do, or patient states will do colonoscopy, uh, seen by Joanna, not tested. These are some of our junk results, as we refer to them. And, um, you know, these are from, uh, these are from tests that got documented in the, H in the EHR as being done. Um, however, you could see a number of them were, were never done. Um, yeah, there's a result in there and, you know, it's being counted as a result because of that. Um, but uh, the way that that is happening, uh, you know, that, that's not giving us an accurate picture of um, the actual screen rate. So we're a lot better at this now than we used to be. Um, this was from a query done in August 2015, and there were only 160. 62 of the 5,356 results, or 3%, and um, from three years ago, that was a huge improvement where we had many, many more of these types of junk results. So we're getting better at capturing our data, but we still have a long way to go. So some of the um, goals with family history and capturing um, some consistent data on family history. Uh, these are from Journal of Clinical Oncology, and I'm pleased to let you know that um, we have all these capabilities within um, ECW for capturing family history. So we can capture information on first-degree relatives, second-degree relatives, both maternal and paternal sides, and for each cancer case in the family, we can establish age of cancer diagnosis and type of primary cancer. So that's the good news. Um, however, there are limited views of um, structured data capture, and um, based on that, we identify some vendor enhancement requests to ECW to address that. Um, the age of diagnosis exists, but it's not intuitive in 
the chart on where to enter that information. So that was another enhancement request that we made. And um, it doesn't allow for ICD code entry and doesn't link to the problem list. So we made a recommendation in the workflow to, um, that uh, family history of colon cancer and other factors for colorectal cancer um, in medical history and problem list um, using ICD-10 code. And um, this was another request that we had for enhancement. And um, this is what the documentation looks like in family history. And, um, you know, Carla, maybe um, you want to uh, comment also, you know, on, on, you know, how this is set up and what that means um, to you as a provider um, when you look at the family history and, and how this could be, you know, improved in terms of the recommendations that we made for, you know, having a more intuitive um, way to know that this is where you're putting the age of the patient and then, you know, even the number of views of um, uh, risk factors that you're able to see um, within the window. Sure. So um, for those on eClinical Works, you know that you have to customize your family history. So these conditions that are you're seeing on the screen now don't just automatically appear, and so it's, um, you need to have someone within your health center be able to do that. And then also, in turn, train all of your staff on how to do this. And you can see there's lots of, you have to first, you know, there's the drop-down status, there's the, um, and then there's the notes section, and then when you're checking the box, so if you do customize the problem, or excuse me, the family history to include colon cancer, and you then check yes, meaning the, the family member has had this condition, being able to then hover over and click on to add the age of diagnosis, because as you know, it's important for when you're going to start your screening. So it's, it's a lot of extra work for the provider or even um, your well-trained medical assistant staff. And so it's, it's not the most user-friendly way to do this. And I think that's when, you know, moving towards putting the family history of colon cancer into the problem list has become the the ideal for a lot of health centers, um, and so being able, if this were to link to the problem list, would be a um, fantastic um, uh, upgrade to have. Yeah, and um, you know, this screen shows, you know, if, if you're entering um, family history and medical history, you could enter it to the problem list and uh, vice versa, um, but one of the recommendations that we made was to also uh, be able to do this, um, to, to add the family history into the problem list from the family history screen. So some of the exploratory measures that we looked at uh, when we um, did our workflow assessment and documentation were uh, screening colonoscopy referrals. Uh, so um, how many um, referrals for colonoscopy are being made? Uh, how many screening colonoscopies, what's the referral to completion time for screening colonoscopies, uh, added, what's the adenoma rate or adenomas detected during colonoscopy, um, whether um, there were positive FIT tests, um, what was the rate of positive FIT tests, and the number of referrals for follow-up colonoscopies after positive FIT, FOBT. The, um, the positive FIT, FOVT is something that, uh, you know, we can pretty much capture um, with more consistent documentation of the results that uh, we'll get even better at documenting the positive FIT and FOVT. Um, screening colonoscopy referrals, a little bit more difficult to capture um, in the current system just because not everyone is using the ICD-10 codes. And um, if that were used, then we would be able to capture uh, this particular measure. On the screening colonoscopy referral to completion time, um, that is a measure where, you know, we really need the date that the test was performed to be entered um, with the referral, and then we would be able to capture this. Since it's hardly ever entered, there's no way we could um, report on this measure at this time. And then adenomas detected during colonoscopy would require that that information be entered in the results that, you know, 
the um, screening test uh, indicated that the individual um, had um, tested positive for cancer, had an adenomas detected during the colonoscopy. Um, so again, that's inconsistent, so we were unable to really provide much data there. Um, yeah, but we were able to go in and look at each of these, um, you know, to see, you know, what we're currently able to capture. We know that the road ahead of us, um, you know, is, is, is a bit long and winding to get there, um, but with more standard um, documentation and consistent um, data entry, we'll be able to move to capturing these. And then in terms of the referrals for follow-up colonoscopies after the positive FIT, FOBT, again, having that reason for the colonoscopy um, associating the ICD-10 code at the time of referral uh, would help us to get to that measure as well. So these are the enhancement requests that we made uh, to ECW uh, <clears throat> within family history, the clinical decision support system, uh, result fields, order screens, and lab orders. I, I mentioned these before, so I'm not going to dwell on these uh, very much now, except to say that um, we have submitted these uh, requests to ECW. We had representatives from ECW at a face-to-face -face meeting with us in November, right after the colorectal cancer roundtable meeting. Uh, so we presented this information to them as well, so they are aware of, um, you know, the interest and desire to be able to better capture and document uh, colorectal cancer screening within the EHR. And, um, you know, we are, um, we are hopeful that they will take our recommendations and, um, you know, make some adjustments based on um, the recommendations from our health centers. And uh, Carla, do you want to talk about our lessons learned, particularly, you know, from the health center perspective? Sure, I think it, um, for for us personally, it goes back to the the billing and really trying to figure out how we can um, most effectively have a workflow for the billing of the fit. We we don't do the FOBT. We're we're using the fit and we're finding that the majority of patients are mailing it in themselves. So it's creating that. Um, figuring out who best to create the either virtual visit or telephone encounter to put in the billing CPT code. And that's on, you know, our next quality improvement PDSA cycle. Um, and I think the, the other thing that we're looking for is a sustainable process for the follow-up of the outstanding fit. So all those that we've ordered that have not been resulted. And we've started working um, with a collaboration of using um, the nursing students that rotate with us to help with callbacks for patients, but again, finding a sustainable system um, because, as you know, it's, a, it's an annual test, and so the you know the the more we are are doing, the more to follow up and frequently, and so um, the colonoscopy might be a more desirable choice for health centers out there because of lack of. Um, support staff to do follow-ups on fit tests that are outstanding. And then the biggest challenge being the closing the loop on referrals, and I think we've made some pretty um, big strides using our structured uh, text, structured data within the referral um, system within eClinical Works and continuing to do that, um, which helps really close the loop. And, and as I'm sure many of you know, uh, improving the process uh, then to get reports back from the specialist. And, and that is beyond our control, but I think the structured data, excuse me, the structured um, fields within the referral at least help us work towards that process. Yeah. And then, you know, for us um, within our network, um, we are, you know, definitely uh, promoting the use of the guide and um, encouraging oh. feedback. Um, and uh, we will continue to uh, evolve the guide as um, we get feedback and improvements to make um, to the uh, best practices workflow and documentation. And you know, as um, as some of those enhancements become available, um, you know, we'll definitely update um, the documentation 
for that as well. And we're still interested in looking at some of those exploratory measures uh, that we haven't yet been able to capture. Um, you know, as more uh, as more health centers adopt the workflow and um, you know utilize some consistent practices around um, you know entering the ICD-10 codes and uh, documenting the results more consistently, uh, we should be able to start capturing those measures and tracking them for improvement and, you know, hopefully also move to a point where that family history capture can be more useful for um, being proactive and identifying individuals who are at higher risk and need to be screened earlier. So, um, you know, we look forward to uh, continuing uh, to collaborate um, with the roundtable and the other organizations uh, to help make that happen, and certainly we'll be um, continuing to promote this within our network. And here is our contact information uh, with a little clip from The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> the lion needs courage, the tin man needs a heart, uh, the scarecrow needs a brain, and the wicked witch is over 50 and she needs a colorectal <laughs> So we are happy to take some questions, and I'll turn it back to Mary. Great. Well, Michelle and Sandy and Carla, that was just wonderful. Really appreciate um, the depth of the work and uh, the, the really practical advice you had to share with everyone on the uh, webinar today. Uh, so definitely please take advantage of uh, the 10 minutes or so that we have left and um, ask uh, any questions you may have for our presenters here today through the chat function. Um, we did get one question in from uh, Gail Sullivan, interested in um, comments from our presenters on this. Have you done any work on capturing completed colonoscopies after positive fit? So um, in order to be able to capture completed colonoscopies, after positive fit, we need to first be able to get to that other, that earlier measure on the number of referrals for colonoscopy after a positive fit, and we're not there yet because of the uh, the lack of uh, um, or not lack of there's high variation in terms of you know how this is documented and. The, because the referral is the only source that we have right now to be able, um, you know, to capture that data. If the ICD-10 code isn't on, in there or, you know, if, if we don't have a way of, um, you know, knowing what the, colon what the colonoscopy was for, um, we're not going to be able to track the completed colonoscopies after a positive FIT. So we would very much like to be able to do that. Um, but we haven't been able to capture that data yet. And this is Sandy, if I could, Michelle, just to add on one of the thoughts throughout the presentation <clears throat> for each clinical work seizures in particular, excuse me, <clears throat> we we talk about the referral, and I know it was highlighted just briefly in here, uh, the process for a referral for a colonoscopy is such that we use the referral form, and, and Carla showed some of the structured data on screen that's so helpful <clears throat> in tracking the follow-up. However, the referrals, as um, eClinical Works users know, uh, are not good sources of structured clinical information. So the, the best practice is really twofold, launching a referral and at the same time, either at the same time or later when the result comes in, uh, creating a DI order. So the referral is a referral and then the referral is a, a test. Some people actually do both instantly. Others wait until the result comes back and use the order screen. So please know that when we talk about referrals in the context of this process, um, you know, we try to be conscious of telling you if we're talking about the order screen or the referral um, over and over again when Michelle referenced the dates, um, date ordered, date completed, that is specific to the order screen. Um, so when you get your result back, as you know also, referrals are not a good place to attach results and send them easily later. That's why the DI order um, is a great way to go on that, um, and you have those available options in there. So in the DI order, we can use the 
ICD of why it was ordered, um, we can enter a result that's close to structured if we follow a, a, a strict workflow practice on that, and we can get those dates that are necessary that can really help with all of that um, analysis of what happens after uh, a colonoscopy referral goes out. <laughs> Okay, great, and we are getting a lot of questions in, so we'll try to get as many as uh, possible. Quick uh, clarification, DI is a diagnostic imaging order. We got a question on that. Um, another question, what type of EBO reports do you run to capture those given an FIT test? I'll take that one from the network perspective. We do not use EBO and haven't for years, so I don't want to um, – Many, many years ago, EBO was very limited in its abilities, and so we um, used an alternate solution. It's called Bridget Free Clinical Works. All of the health centers use it, the network uses it, and that is our, our data solution. That is not to say that EBO is impossible um, for that task, but we have, have not um, taken that approach, so I can't speak to that. Okay, any other comments on that from Michelle or, or uh, Dr. Henke? The same, we use Bridget, so we have not used EBO. Okay. Um, how soon should a patient get the colonoscopy scheduled after a positive fit test? I, I can take this one. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're really recommending as soon as possible, just um, with any with any positive r result, um, the sooner the referral is made, um, it's more likely that the patient will go to the referral as well as e easing any anxieties from a, a positive test that one would have. Um, so we don't necessarily have a, a standard, um, but with the exception of, you know, with any abnormal lab result, we, the, our own internal policy is to get the result to the patient within, um, you know, three business days and making every attempt to contact them and do so, uh, so that would you know, I think getting the referral within the week of having the positive test, and it, of course, then depends on how quickly you can schedule with your local specialist. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, what do you do if you put a future order for a FIT test and the patient never comes and you can never reach them? Do you address the FIT order and eClinical Works as expired or remove the order? Does it affect your reports from um, eClinical Works? This is Carla. So I think how uh, we've handled future orders where we can't contact the patient in the past because um, we're still working on the process for what to do with outstanding fits. But in general, uh, we tend to uh, our documentation process is via telephone encounter to document all attempts made to contact patient. We use the three phone calls and then we send a certified letter um, or a letter or a certified letter depending on the importance and. Um, we would then usually delete the future order so that, but we have all the documentation that we did attempt to order this for the patient um, within a telephone encounter. Okay, that's helpful. Um, question about receiving a copy of the slides. Uh, if for folks that registered as of first thing this morning, we did send out the slides by email, um, but we will send out again as well as the replay shortly after um, this presentation. We usually get those out uh, within a day or two. Um, two similar questions side by side. Why do you open both a referral and a DI in eClinical Works? Can you just use a diagnostic imaging as a referral? And similar question, my center tracks colonoscopies in DI instead of referrals. Is there a reason you use referral tab to document colonoscopies? So uh, with, within our system, um, because of the the managed care organization world, our, our patients do require an actual referral to go to um, the specialist for the colonoscopy, and so it has to be generated because of that, and it also is where we have the structured data for follow-up. And so our workflow has been that the provider um, generates the referral, and then our referral specialist creates the DI order. And so it, we recognize it a little. It is somewhat duplicative, but um, we do have to do the referral. And then, as Michelle and Sandy both mentioned, the DI itself is how we actually um, do our reporting. And so we 
um, within eClinical Works and within all the health centers in the health center control network. Um, that is the workflow that we have chosen and uh, to cover um, all necessary procedures for this. Okay, that's helpful. Um, what would an expected cost be to make the required, the requested enhancements to eClinical Works system for, um, I, I'm not quite sure the acronym here, NCH of NYC, I assume that means the network. <laughs> Any any guess on cost? Uh, this is Sandy, and you know, there's. I don't have a guess on cost. I <clears throat> my hope is zero, in that they will find value in the enhancements that are requested because they affect so many other things. It's not all. It, they're not only uh, going to be beneficial for this, but but so many other um, avenues. So my hope is zero, and I, I, if it's not zero, I can't imagine what price tag they would uh, put on that. Yeah, and, and, you know, it's always a tough question and perhaps a naive answer on my part, but, you know, the hope is, you know, as you see your rates increase, you know, there's more opportunity for, you know, getting recognition for these types of quality improvements that help align with different requirements for, you know, patient centered medical home recognition. So it, it all kind of fits together in, you know, promoting a quality improvement program. I know that's not a very satisfying answer, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put that up anyway. Um, so uh, another question, how widely used is eClinical Works in community health centers? Could you create a general checklist to guide uh, folks in assessing the capacity enhancements needed for other EHR brands? So I'll take the first half of the question and interested in the in what our presenters have to say on the second half of the question. Um, we worked with NAC on this in selecting eClinical Works. It's one of the top five um, systems used within uh, FQHCs, and it's sort of neck and neck with NextGen. It's sort of the, the top one and two. Uh, but an, an, a wonderful suggestion about, you know, how could we tease out what we learned in this practice to other EHR brands, and I'll, I'll um, let Sandy or, or Michelle answer that question. So uh, I believe it's possible, absolutely. I think we can look at uh, the challenges and um, the resulting sort of immediate enhancements and, um, you know, you're well aware, Mary, that beyond the, what we consider those quote-unquote easy enhancements, <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot more to be done, but we, we need to start with the basics. Uh, so I do think we it's possible, absolutely, to look through that and, and come up with, you know, a basic um, guideline for a checklist that folks should investigate um, within their own products. Yeah, and I, I like that suggestion, very practical way to take the information we've developed here and, um, and uh, not wait for an entirely new um, uh, best practices tool for another vendor. So thanks for the suggestion. Uh, another question, do you track, uh, track the um, – fit FOBT follow-up that your nursing students are performing? If so, how and where is that documented and structured? So we um, didn't do any necessarily structured data fields for the follow-up that these nursing students were doing, and it, they were with us for such a limited time that um, we were really utilizing it to um, callback patients we hadn't seen, and so they were documenting within the telephone encounter just that they had made the attempt to call, um, and they came across many different responses often that they couldn't get a hold of the patient, and so we would send a letter, um, and then the other common response was the patient lost the kit, and so um, it, the telephone encounter was then forwarded to the provider to see if they wanted to reorder another fit. Um, offer the patient to come in to pick up a new one, or if the patient at that point um, preferred to have a colonoscopy. Um, all right, well, wonderful. Well, miraculously, we got through all the questions with one minute left to spare. So uh, an absolute huge thank you uh, for that very rich presentation. If you'll forgive a quick advertisement, um, we have scheduled our next webinar uh, for June 29th, Wednesday at noon Eastern, and it will be focused on implementing FIT-based screening programs. Um, also, another acknowledgement for the funders of, um, of the guide. It was a wonderful uh, collaborative process and a, a lot of heavy lifting from many of our partners. So thank you uh, um, uh, to Michelle and Sandy and the rest of um, the mentor centers 
and the Pilot Centers for your work on this project. And uh, with that, really appreciate everyone's time today. And uh, we will be sending around a replay, uh, an evaluation survey in the slides um, within the next day or two. So thanks, everyone, for your time. Really wonderful webinar today.